Well, hello there, and welcome back to the Agostino Zinger Show with me, your host, Agostino Zinger, and this is episode number 436. That's 436 of the Agostino Zinger Show. How you doing? How you feeling? Great, amazing, good to hear. How am I doing as good as I can on this godforsaken day? If it's your first time, check out the show via YouTube. Make sure you smash that like button, hit subscribe, and leave me a comment down below. And of course, if you're listening via the podcast app, a five-star review, a share would be more than welcomed. And of course, support via Patreon is always more than welcome to at patreon.com. For just Agostino, you can find that in the description down below. Click on that link, get subscribed for a little one dollar per month or the equivalent of one pound to get access to my bonus shows that'll be going out this week so jump on board get involved on the patreon don't delay get involved on there today yeah 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 how's it going how you feeling what's the vibe out there let me know what's the vibe over here pretty decent um what have we done just watch United stink out the place, you know, at home against Real Sociedad. Bit of a nothing game in the Europa League, don't get me wrong. Doesn't really matter because we're already through. We've managed to score four goals away from home in Europe. Uh, pretty stellar performance in the first leg. But the second leg, God almighty. From the starting lineup to the substitutions, to the tactics, to the style of play, formation. We're, we're just a... Uh, sometimes I wonder, I think part of the reason why I think I'm not so... Um, triggered or I don't get so um, you know I don't get so I don't get, I don't have my my nose doesn't get bent out of place or I don't get so emotional when it comes to politics it's because I've been a long time fan of football right and I followed United for as long as I can remember for as long as I had a consciousness of knowing what team to support that might have been what 11 12 or something like that so I support United I'm not too sure so it's been a while right so I think with that comes the realisation that you have little to no control over anything your club does, whether it's selling your favourite player, um, not signing someone that you like, um, sacking the manager, um, direction of the club, sponsorship, whether moving stadiums, you have no say, you have no say, zero. What you are as a fan is that you just follow your team through the lows and through the highs. That's all you can kind of give to them. And of course, they value that because that's basically where most of these clubs' revenue come from. You can see it's quite funny as well. There was a long period of time where clubs kind of were, you know, they made it known that when fans had little to no influence on the club, and they wouldn't really take their voice and, you know, that wouldn't really like them to be heard. Or if they were heard, they were sort of like a sanitized version of a fan. And in the moment we had, you know, COVID struck the world and it kind of reduced the earning capabilities of some of the biggest clubs in the world, even the smallest, they realized quite quickly how important fans were to football teams. But anyway, I digress. Quite quickly, what you learn is that you don't have any influence on it. All you can do is cheer on your team when they're winning support them when they're losing that's all you can do um but sometimes at the top top level especially where my united are currently trying get to get back to it's not as um it's not um it's not something that you sort of give hope on that your team could suddenly turn it around because you've seen it happen to other clubs you've seen different owners come in with a probably more uh, sporting um, ambitions, wanting to win trophies and turn clubs around. You just look at Man City, right? They were a bit of a joke before the Saudis got involved and now look at them suddenly, right? They're playing some of the best football. They're on the longest winning streak known to man. They've got the best coach in the world. Some, you know, uh, free players for every position. It's just insane because obviously they have owners that come in and know, you know, they kind of have a big plan in, in mind. So I think when you're at the top echelons of football, you sometimes can get a little bit, you can give yourself false hope because you know sometimes with a change of manager and change of ownership, things can change like that overnight. But in this case with Man United, we're in a weird position because Ole Gunnar Solskjaer is doing a pretty decent job, all things considered, right? He's probably our best manager post Sir Alex Ferguson in general, right? In terms of how he kind of approaches the club, the players liking him, um, whatever, even our role in the media, we've kind of, you know, we've kind of gone back, especially in the beginning of the season, we were winning loads of penalties. We went back to being hated again and that was quite a thrilling experience, right? Because I remember growing up when I was younger, I mean, winning everything under the sun, we we're the most hated club in the country. People, you know, the arrogance that we had, the authority, especially with the service Ferguson in charge as well. He rubbed people up the wrong way. So to be hated in the beginning of the season was quite gratifying. Like, oh, look, we're back where we need to be. But then slowly but surely, you know, um, the 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 cracks in the team and the management 
um and our approach just you know obviously came to light and now we are where we are where we're kind of in this odd kind of it feels like a false position we don't really feel like we should be second considering how bad we play but sometimes but the thing is what separates us from everybody else we just have some very high quality players especially further up in the pitch and attack um and i think with that we've been able to kind of get out of jail right a few times where we probably haven't played the best or we've maybe got dominated or whatever it may be and then you know it's cost us to some games obviously um i think of west brom being one of those but for the most part we've kind of got away with it and we're in this opposition where if Oli continues with this form that we're currently on we're most likely going to finish second and even if we don't get a trophy it's quite hard to justify second a manager that finishes second in the league without you know um behind a man city side that's got all all the money you know more money than god um and they're willing to splash as much as they can especially with financial fair play being a joke as it is at the moment um so yeah we're in a weird position we're in a strange place but sometimes as well it gets annoying because i think to myself what do we have to lose seven games on the trot and get knocked out all competitions for managers to get fired or for some change to happen in terms of our because you know what i'll be happy with actually I'll take that back. I'd be happy with just Solskjaer staying in the coaching position and just getting in different people to manage the footballing side of it, like, you know, player recruitment, overall vision, whatever it may be. So they can set out some clear goals um, and a clear idea of where we kind of want to go back, go go to and kind of go from there. Because sometimes you think to yourself, like, what is our actual long-term plan with Oli in charge? What do we want to do? Is there, like, a five-year plan? Do we want to, like, win a trophy in that time? Are we trying to win the league? Like, what is actually going on? Or are we just trying to finish as high as we can up the league and then whatever else we get is a bonus? Because that's what it kind of feels like at the moment. Oli's starting to feel like, you know, the latter years of Arsenal Wenger where he was just, you know happy to pull off a top four finish which you've in a, in a retrospect you know especially with the Arsenal team like considering how the other managers post Wenger have kind of struggled he did a pretty miraculous job getting them consistently in the top four but I don't know man I think strange team United man and even today against Royal Sociedad we didn't have any real patterns of play there was no real style no real substance of what we were doing it all just felt a bit kind of freestyle the kids came on in Shola and I'm at it it was just you know, they hardly touched the ball. I think Schuller got like five touches of the ball in 15, 20 minutes playing centre midfield. It's absolutely insane. It goes to show just how um, badly coached I think our side is where there's no patterns of play that would get our wingers or centre midfielders on the ball consistently. And it does go to show why somebody like a, um, you know, ver uh, sorry, Donny van der Beek is struggling, right? Because he's used to playing in a team where there's patterns of play that involve, that kind of get certain people involved in the game as they're going further and further up the pitch right so Donny Van Beek is used to touching the ball in and around let's say the left hand side of the opposition box you know inside the box outside the whatever it is he's used to touching the ball in certain places and manipulating it coming into space receiving it taking defenders away from his teammate to create more space blah -de blah 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 and just even wing play right there should be a pattern that we should have in terms of wing play right where the balls may be knocked inwards and knocked out again for you to take on and i don't know whatever there's something i missed there. i don't know what it is the ideal solution would be you know for everybody that's kind of only in would be for him to actually go out and get a coach that's actually got experience right somebody that's actually um, one stuff to come and maybe sit alongside him um that would be pretty good balance because you know supposedly he doesn't take his own training sessions which is insane when i read that quote i was like what he doesn't even take oh this is the way i like to manage he's like what like for somebody that's not done much in like you know leagues that matter he's got a real sense of you know self about him so which i think you're meant to have you should have that kind of level of arrogance i think there's you know that's probably what um messed up david moyes at united he didn't really have that arrogance you know to kind of come in and say no i'm my united manager so definitely has that right um even though he probably doesn't have the minerals the actual you know x factor to kind of take us to the next level as we've seen with our losses in the semi-finals and whatever they may be but i don't know man it's just a weird place to be you i think any other top club would have probably made a change already that was a united we have a weird thing with letting go of terrible players and getting rid of managers we have a strange thing about it we tend to always wait until it's gone it gets really really bad and then we make the change it's like just make the change when because you know i don't know like it's just really strange that isn't it why that seems to happen we can't seem to get rid of some tell like you know rojo just left a what last transfer window rojo just left he's been surplus to requirements for like what two years 
Ashley Young and Lukaku only left because they wanted to leave. Don't get fooled by the propaganda from United. He didn't let them go. Um, same goes for Alex Sanchez. Alexis Sanchez, sorry. Weird. Weird team, man. But anyway, what can you do? What can you do? Anyway, we've got a jam-packed show for you today. Loads of stuff to get involved with. So make sure you grab yourself a drink and something to nibble on. And let's get in bold. Okay, number one topic to talk about here. We got some amazing news, some great news, some sensational news, actually. Um, courtesy of the BBC, I'm sure most of you are aware, but over here in the UK, Boris Johnson, our Prime Minister, has unveiled plans to end the England restrictions due to COVID 19 by June 21st. We have light at the end of the tunnel. Things are going to get back to normal sooner rather than later, and I cannot be more happier. I guess in other times, you know, prior, maybe last year, yeah, maybe last year, I would have been a little bit more pessimistic about this and, oh, let's take it easy, let's chill. Da, 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 da. But now, after spending this amount of time indoors, the last thing I want to do is be pessimistic. The last thing I want to do is be easy, and I'm all for this. And to be honest as well, considering how, you know, crappy this was handled, you know, at the start and at the end during the middle of this whole thing, this probably is pro this approach, this sort of like slow, gradual approach, opening up and testing at all points, I think it's supposed to be a five-week gap in between each stage. Um, it's probably the best way to go, especially when you consider how terrible, again, um, we dealt with it in general. We, you know, yeah, let's say we, because it's not just the Prime Minister, Jim, you know, I think we all had a part, our part to play in it, going to people's houses and whatnot. So this is the following here. It says... Um, a new four-step plan to ease the England's lockdown can uh, could see the all legal limits on social contact lifted by 21st of June. Shops, hairdressers and gyms and outdoor hospitality could reopen on the 12th of April. That is going to be mad. Um, from 17th of May, two households might be allowed to mix in homes, while the rural six could apply for places like pubs. It requires four tests on vaccines, infections, rates, and new coronavirus variants. Prime Minister Boris Johnson told MPs the plan aimed to be cautious and irreversible. That's what you want to hear, right? Cautious but irreversible. The last thing we want is a lockdown part four. <laughs> It's quite wild to think that we had three lockdowns and we couldn't get the numbers, the R number down to anything significant until we had a vaccine. Like, I dread to think what this country would have looked like without a vaccine. Like, we're so lucky. We're really, really fortunate that we have, you know, the medical professionals we have in this country that were able to, um, you know, get this approved in record time, quick turnaround, I'm sure. You know, certain people are going to probably end up getting Nobel Peace Prizes for this or whatever it may be, or whatever else distinction you get when you do things like this. But <sighs> imagine where the UK would have been without a vaccine. Just imagine. Jesus. And it continues here. Um, there are no credible route to a zero COVID Britain, nor indeed a zero COVID world. Yeah, that's true, I guess, to a certain extent. We were never going to do it because <clears throat> we tried to do the herd immunity thing. It clearly didn't work. And then by that time, the government already, you know, decided that they were going to do this sort of hands-off approach, let the British public make, what did, what did they say? Sensible choices, common sense choices. And, you know, if you know anything about great British public, you give, you give them an option to make a choice and they're going to make the bad choice. <laughs> no. Oh, Jesus. I'm included in that one. You give me an option. You give me a multiple question, um, a multiple, yeah, a multiple answer test and I'm going to get a few wrong. I'll tell you that. I'm going to get a few wrong. Um, and then here's a step by step here as part of it we've got april so uh, march 8th of course is the main date where the kids go back to school so the teachers and um get a chance to go back into school kids get a chance to you know go back and meet their friends parents get a rest from their devilish kids 29th of march you've got outdoor gatherings and sports which is great can get back into playing five side of football get rid of this flipping gut second uh term from 12th of april non-essential retail opens so you can go buy some underwear and all that malarkey hairdressers as well correct because as you can see i'm trying to do that thing like people do where you wear a hat to cover your head because you've got a bad hair day but pff, doesn't really matter does it to be honest hair's already calamity as it is um, some public buildings and libraries are going to be open. Outdoor seating with alcohol takeaway is going to be available. So loads of alfresco um, lunches and dinners on that monarchy. Indoor leisure systems like swimming pools and uh, gyms are going to be open too. Self-contained holiday accommodation. Like absolutely superb, man. Superb news all around. Um, really, really grateful that this is happening. And like I said, I think this comes at just the right time for most people. I think most of us are probably reaching our wits end in terms of dealing with this. Um, it's taken a lot um, 
of mental strength to withstand a lot of this. And unfortunately, we've had a few of our citizens pass away due to various complications that come off the back of this. And I'm sure in future years, we're going to look back at this time and really shake our heads at the approach that we took to it. Um, we, de we didn't, uh, it just goes to show, I think now we have enough information, enough time has passed, uh, there's, enough inf there's enough case studies out there to say that, you know, lockdowns only work in the beginning. And especially if you do them strictly, you can't do the hands-off approach. You can't do the make your own decision up. You can't do the open borders. You can't do that. You, if you're under the lockdown, you have to lock down the country properly. But then, of course, that requires some draconian measures that some countries are probably not going to, or some citizens are not going to be too happy to have enforced or imposed on their livelihood. But that's just the way it is. And unfortunately, with the way things are going, but hey, at least there's some light at the end of the tunnel. Um, we'll be resuming normal life from the 8th of March basically because kids are going back to school because it's odd isn't it it's, as, um, as, as much as it doesn't involve me because I don't have kids I don't know anyone that you know that's going to take their kid there it is oddly uh, a sign of normality to hear like school kids on their school run outside the window you know going on uh, the buses driving by and being packed full of kids as well it does kind of give you a semblance of normality because it's, it's quite weird isn't it going out for a run or going to shops popping out and just seeing nobody right seeing a few people but no one that's doing stuff right there's no one coming back from work because everyone's working from home uh, for the most part there's no kids gallivanting around because they're not in school it just feels strange so that's definitely going to be another sign another hint that we're back to some semblance of normality and i can not wait but of course, the most important news in all of this, the one that really tickles my fancy and gets me all hot and bothered, is the news that nightclubs will be reopening on the 21st of June. Oof. Are you dumb? Are you stupid? Like, how hype is that? Um, I think I mentioned prior in a other podcast that I was expecting us to be back on a dance floor in a normal sense i don't mean social distancing i don't mean dancing in a flipping hula hoop or dancing around a table or dancing sitting down i mean like what we were doing in 2019 i had the vision or my idea my estimation my guess was that it was going to return in early 2022 um of course you know uh the, i didn't account for the vaccine but that's when i generally thought there was going to be some return back to semblance of normality but with the vaccine it's just sped things up again isn't it um and it's odd as well because for the longest time i think maybe for the first 11 months the government never mentioned a single thing about nightclubs it kind of just left off the table i don't think even boris or anyone in the government actually said the even word the nightclubs in general um so when it was announced that this will be part of the roadmap, you saw, okay, this definitely is a step in the right direction, definitely a sign that the numbers are going down, are going in the right direction to kind of allow this to happen. Because as you most people know, you know, COVID definitely does spread from what we've seen so far. Um, this kind of place where it incubates is in, you know, enclosed spaces with not much, you know, ventilation, all these stuff, blah, 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 blah. People perspiring, shouting, screaming. It's probably the perfect place for people to catch COVID. So the fact that they're willing and, and on opening up from the June going forward, not August, not September, June, it's definitely a hint that things are step in the right direction. So this is courtesy of RA. It says UK nightclubs could reopen earliest on June 21st, according to the government uh, new COVID-19 roadmap clubs, which fall under... The final step of Boris Johnson's four-step plan of easing restrictions will be among the f last places to open to the public. Monday, June 21st is the earliest possible date, though it's subject to review. Each step of the roadmap will be um, separated by at least five weeks. So, you know, they're giving themselves enough room, enough wiggle room in case things go wrong, which we're hoping it doesn't, to make changes. But it is encouraging, right? Because... You know, it's the last place. It was always going to be, you know, the first place to close and the last place to open, which, you know, we kind of all kind of understood, again, like I said, with how COVID spreads. But this definitely is a cause for celebration, I would say. It says here, also falling under step four as a roadmap is going to be large events, which include music festivals. Whether these, re these return depends on the outcomes of the government scientific events research program. A series of pilot events with large crowds occur, re reduce social distancing scheduled to begin in April. That's pretty cool. Um, they're probably going to do the same thing that Barcelona did in Barcelona, where they had this that little 
test run trial for Primavera Sound, and that went out. That went off without a hitch. I think they had like a thousand or fourteen hundred. Yeah, one thousand four hundred. I think so about people in there. So a decent amount of people. No social distancing or anything. Just a test uh, before you went in. And of course, if you you know negative, you go. If you're positive, you could tell to go to hell home. So I could see something like that happening in the UK. We've got you know a plethora of festivals and promoters willing to probably be part of that little test run and experiment. Um, that's going to be cool. Step three says here, which will begin no earlier than May 17 will allow for some large events with outdoor events capped at 1000 for people, uh, 1000 people. So 50% of capacity outdoor events for a thousand or 50% of their capacity and outdoor seated events for 10,000 or 25% of their capacity. Quote, festival organizers only want to return when it's safe to do so, says Paul Reed, the CEO of Associations of Independent Festivals, he said. But if the easing of the restrictions does lose momentum, events are suddenly cancelled as a result. It's vital that our sector receive swift and targeted government support and compensate uh, to compensate. In addition, government intervention on insurance and VAT remain of critical. Yeah, that's the big I think, um, reason why we didn't see Glastonbury, right? Um, the insurance, they couldn't get that all approved before the days and of course you know just logistically putting that festival together is going to be a nightmare but i'm assuming a lot of places won't want to be liable especially you know uh mainly liable you have, I, i'm assuming you're going to get some sort of partial liability insurance but you don't want to be completely liable for it on your own especially when it comes to covid in it but yeah step in the right direction man oh what how brilliant is it going to be to be standing outside of a club hearing the bass rattling through the walls as you prattle about in the queue, you know, looking up and down, seeing if you're in the right spot. Are you in the VIP queue? Are you in the general queue? You know, faffing around with your ticket from RA at the door, getting it scanned, the QR code, you know, emptying your contents into a little bowl, saying hi to the ticket here, or walking up the stairs, or down the stairs, or through the door, or through a curtain. It's going to be epic, man. It's really going to be epic. Like, And again, um, it depends. And I think if you're one of those cheeky sods that were out during lockdown, then you're probably going to pretend like, oh, it's the first time I've been now. I'm feeling great. This is amazing. But for myself, it's going to be so weird because I've legitimately not been anywhere that you could call a club apart from, you know, the Pirate Studio places a few times here and there. But I've not been in anything that will resemble a club this entire time. I think the last place, last time I probably went out, might have been X a while to see God Jansen. I think that might be my last actual event or rave of that kind of extent. So it's going to be an epic, epic, epic um, uh, thing to go back to. Again, it's probably going to be a bit messy. There's going to be a lot of victims. It's going to be a lot of probably um, <laughs> going to be a lot of ambulances, you know, uh, blazing by as you're on your way to the club somewhere. Probably a couple of scraps, people losing phones and wallets. But, you know, say la vie, man. At least you have some stories to tell in it because God forbid you telling a story of what happened in 2020 in it. Not much really to tell, which is interesting, isn't it? I think. Have it, haven't you kind of thought of that? Um, you have a lack of kind of stories and experiences to share from last year. Most of what I remember has been stuff that's happened to other people, not myself. You know what I mean? You don't really have any moment uh moment uh monumental experiences or whatever that term is right there's nothing i can kind of look back on it and think oh yeah this happened that happened of course because guess what we were all indoors it's so weird isn't it we've been so which has been i, I would imagine a lot of these people especially influencers or mostly celebrities i guess as ones that are always involved in controversy online i'd assume this is probably the best time for them isn't it they probably picked up a bunch of followers because people are just bored and literally legitly want to be distracted from the you know the doom lottery that happens on sky news and bbc news and stuff right the scaremongering on the flipping guardian website and shit so whatever you can provide doesn't matter how crappy it is the other distraction people are willing to kind of dive on deep because you know what's the point of living if all you're living for is just keep hearing you know flipping What's his name? Paige Van Zandt, JT Van Zandt, whatever that guy's name is, right? JTV. Like, oh, I can't wait to go back to normal. So I just stop paying attention to the news and politics. It's just like, it's so boring. God almighty, man. Again, maybe it's a football thing because like, what what do we have? What, what influence and what can we do to change things? Nothing. We can complain as much as we want. Like, you know, 
look at look at the old BLM thing, right? You could, you go and protest, you go and cry and flipping in front of people in Canberra and London and shit. You put your fist up, uh, you dress in you know paramilitary, all black. You harken back to the days of the Black Panther, and guess what happens? They're still kicking black people in the head with flipping, you know, steel toe cap boots. They're still pushing old men down the street, having his head hit that, hit the concrete and then being cleared of all charges. Just the other day, I saw another thing. Some guy, other police officer in America got cleared of charges for shooting some woman with a bloody rubber bullet in her eye and now she can't see anymore. No charges coming against him whatsoever. It's like, God, man, nothing actually legitimately changes. So that's why sometimes I think to myself, like, I follow a lot of these sort of like, you know, professional Politi political analyst and journalist quote unquote and it must be such a boring life to be consist com to be utterly consumed by all of that shit it's bad enough when you're the kind of person that you know you can't talk about anything else but sports right that's your whole world you don't have any other interests outside of that it can get a little bit nauseating just imagine it when it has to do with flipping politics then it's just like yeah 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 man especially the ones that especially those kind of um, political hipsters that are like you know really up and kind of in tune with what's happening in Ukraine and Hungary and flipping say like, relax you know what I mean relax you don't live there you don't know what the day-to-day -day life is like for people over there they're a different temperament different makeup to you um, you know they come from a whole different struggle point in point in life they've struggled in a completely different way than you have it's just just not even bother you know what I mean they, it's like you have enough stuff to worry about in your own home than going to try and fix whatever else is happening around the world but you know I don't know man I don't know people have their hobbies I guess and it call them that hobbies um, and then of course the first uh, bit of news in terms of clubs opening is the cause I got this little this is nice to see in it there was a time and place where you'd kind of want to well m myself in, myself probably only you'd purposely want to keep unsubscribing yourself from promotional emails because they get annoying especially those ones that are like oh 99% of tickets are sold out and it's the Friday before the thing 99% against your last chance like no it isn't we know you've only halfway sold out your event relax but this was welcomed. I actually enjoyed receiving an email promotion from a nightclub telling me that they're going to be opened. And you can feel the enthusiasm from this. This is from The Cause um, and Costa del Sol. It says, yes, 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 boozing and dancing raving is coming back after nearly a year of despair and on and off lockdowns, scotch eggs and generally not knowing what the hell is happening. We're now on the road to recovery and announced two very, very special weekends. We've got here, Costa del Sol Tottenham, um, Friday 16th to the 18th of April it says following Boris's speech or uh, our fresco drinking is set to return from April and that means last year's hottest social distancing summer holiday resort is back with a twist so that's the one where we sit on the tables we don't really give a shit about that we've got to scroll down this is the one we want right dance energy the cause third birthday on the 31st of July to the 1st of August it says we are back to celebrate life social contact our birthday and our freedom to dance marking our full weekend for our mammoth return of rave expect multiple sound systems three of our favorite selectors some of our favorite selectors special guests new and old friends together as one on the dance floor to mark the occasion birthdays will start at 10 a.m 10 a.m bro do you know how messy it's gonna be on the street with people if they're gonna be um drinking and going and getting on it right getting on it on it from 10 a.m do you know how crazy that's going to be Oof. um get up and get down bring the energy we're going in early bird tickets are absolutely flying for this grab one whilst you can Oof. it's gonna be epic man again i can't wait man again it's just like such a refreshing thing to see those kind of things in your email box again we're back to some semblance of normality and i for one am over the moon um what else do we have here oh this is good news too um all adults in the uk will be offered the jab by the 31st of july which i guess should open up international travel for a lot of us because i'm assuming most places will require you to have a negative test uh, for covid which of course is you spending you know upwards of like 60 pounds anywhere from i think in the uk is anywhere between 60 to 250 <clears throat> to get the test done so you're, you're probably more you're probably better off just waiting to get the vaccine and then being able to go out and travel and then having some sort of document or whatever that proves your covid uh you've been vaccinated against covid and um unfortunately this is going to be one of those things that we're going to have to really wrestle with if you're somebody that kind of is a bit uncomfortable with the idea of you know giving up your privacy and your liberties in order to travel and go to certain places this is just going to be part of course unfortunately going forward we're going to be in a position where if you legitimately want to go to a country that probably hasn't 
you know rolled out the vaccine as <clears throat> as for as kind of extensively as we have or places that you know are generally taking a different approach you're going to need to prove that you're not going to be a danger to the ecosystem by presenting some kind of certificate some kind of document whatever it is that proves you've been vaccinated or at least that you're negative um that's your only way obviously as technology develops and goes further and further and you know the more tests are implemented or i, I could see uh, a future where maybe some airlines offer you know same day testing before your flight but you know so some of those same day tests i've read are not the most um, accurate things in the world they can get things wrong i think it happened to elon musk recently right he got like a double neck he got like a double negative and a positive or something like that so it can you know there can be some anomalies here or there but this is the only way really i see the world reopening you know the way it was prior um is people being able to do this so it's just gonna be one of those things you can have to really wrestle with yourself. And again, it's it's probably a binary thing, and if you're gonna go, if you're gonna travel abroad, <clears throat> and you want to go to a different country, it's just one of those things you're gonna have to do. There is no real way of getting around it, unfortunately. Um, and then I think uh, one community of people who will probably not give a fuck about you know getting them getting themselves vaccinated <laughs> will be the people who um, frequent places like Ibiza. So this is courtesy of Mix Magazine. Will Ibiza be open in 2021? Everything we know so far. So it says the following. Um, it's good news for Ibiza in 2021. Spain looks set to welcome its tourists from spring, meaning Ibiza will reopen this summer, which is mad. And I didn't think that was going to be a thing. Um, Spain went for a little, you know, some peaks and valleys here and there. But generally, they've been on the same sort of direction that we have. Um, you know, so to see this turn around, especially considering the amount of people that flock there, they have to take all the precautions necessary and make sure if, if they're actually legitimately ready. And I guess, you know, or maybe it just might be a situation where, similar to the places that some of these DJs are going to play at for these play graves, some of these countries just, you know what I mean, they just have to, unfortunately, sacrifice their own citizens for tourism because without it, the country will implode, right? Uh, you know, a large portion of their GDP comes through comes via tourism so without it they, they're literally on their knees and they're having to make a tough decision over choosing foreigners and, you know, um, their own countrymen, their own civilians, their own citizens. It's just like... It gets dark when you think about it that way because essentially they're doing that so that you can go and enjoy your mimosa, right? Um, knee deep in some pool that's been, you know, frequented by a million and one different people. It's a little bit of a grim, it's a little bit of a grim bargaining uh, agreement, but it's like, oof. It continues here. It says the Spanish foreign minister announced that Spain would allow its tourists to visit country, allow tourists, sorry, visit country as soon as possible during a presentation in January. The Spanish Prime Minister Pedro Sanchez also said that he wants the Spanish population to be vaccinated as quickly as possible so that the country can progressively open up to tourism. Okay, cool. Vaccinate everyone first and open it up. The beacon of resurrection um, of a tourism in, is the. Uh, the beacon of the resurrection of tourism in the world okay cool so the so there is a thing about being first i guess they want to be the first major european city to open up um and of course you know it's, it's used I, I would guess spain is like one of the maybe if not the number one probably top two you know sunny locations that a lot of europeans go to visit anyway for their holidays i know a lot of germans like to go to spain um italians maybe not so much not too sure maybe they just travel uh, further down south um maybe heading toward Naples, that probably a bit more sunny. Better, better, boom. But who knows? Continues here. Um, Spain is working on a vaccine passport with the EU as an element of safe mobility when foreign travel returns properly. So a vaccine could help you get in by be the summer. It's going to be interesting for DJs that are like anti-vax, right? Because if you're anti-vax, you're going to need to get a test every time you go. You're also going to need to pay for your visa. Um, that's a lot of expenses, a lot of headache, right? You're not actually going to be able just to jump on a Ryanair and hop over and play in flipping Amsterdam and shit. You're going to need to, you're going to, need to shell out a lot of money. So it's really going to test a lot of these anti-vaxxers resolve. I wish I have, you know, again, I don't have a problem with it. I think if you want to be anti-vax, do your thing, right? You should be free to choose as you please. Um, I just don't agree that, you know, if you do make that choice and you end up bedridden in a coma that suddenly everyone around you starts crying, it's like, nah, you don't need to cry now. You know what I mean? You choose your bed, you lie in it, you know, figuratively speaking. Um, but yeah, man, imagine just being, I don't know, a middle tier, lower tier DJ and you're having to shell close to what, 300 pounds before you even play the gig somewhere. 300 pounds coming out of your fee. I guess some to be, you know, maybe the sensible thing would be the promoter kind of offsetting the charge. So if they're going to book you, they sort that out. That'll be part of your itinerary. 
it's out of here, wherever that is, right? Or whatever they they need to book you. Um, you know, in terms of you know setup and stuff, that might be included in it. Hey, if you book me, you're gonna have to contribute something towards the actual testing and shit. But yikes! It continues. Uh, plans are, are afoot to welcome some British and German tourists to Ibiza ahead of the island's official reopening for a coronavirus safety test scheme. This also it took place um, successfully last year before the island opened its borders to tourists. They say British and German. Why don't they include Italians? Italians love love a bit of tech house, isn't it? They continue. Uh, the Balearic Tourism um, Department has said that we are working jointly with the private sector. In this case, hoteliers and the tourism pilot plan will only be launched when appropriate in terms of safety and travel restrictions by be fair slowly but surely getting back to normal bars and restaurants on the island will be able to open its outdoor terraces from the 5th of march or even before us um and once travel restrictions from the uk and the rest of the world have lifted i be ready to welcome tourists with the british visitors making up the island's main market yeah 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 main market in it and none of them speak a, speak a lick of spanish not one iota not one one bit not even a poquito zero it continues um anna gordillo chair of the hoteliers association of beef and a forment uh, formentera recently told the press that the uk is our main market and it's good news that the uk's vaccination rates are so good they will be the first to come back on the island yeah look they are desperate to get us over there man like they're like please please come back in it bloody hell so so maybe we might see the end of that because there is a little bit of snobbism or snobbery involved in dance music when it comes to spanish and to italian and french tourists right people tend to have kind of you know stick their nose up in the air and be like oh those they're so annoying they make so much noise it's like whenever i go to berlin and there's always a, like, a group of spanish or italian people you know whistling or shouting people always kind of turning back and looking at them and giving them dirty looks and shit but in reality these people are the ones that are literally legitimately keeping your club and your scene afloat you know, it's really wild to think that, but these are the people that are legitimately paying their hard-earned money, coming with groups of six boys, you know, buying 10 shots, <laughs> right? Like, they're the ones that are doing it, all putting their coats in a cloakroom, like, they legitimately spend pee, and they travel well, right? They go to all these places, Frankfurt, uh, Georgia, Kiev, like, they're in these places, so... I think this might end some of the snobbery that's involved in dance music because it is quite annoying. I, I'm not really a big fan of it. I get it, you know, that 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 lot can be annoying and shit, but I think it's just part of um, nightlife. You're going to have some unsavory characters that you probably wouldn't want to, you know, see outside of a club in any way, shape or form. Um, some annoying characters, some frustrating ones, but it's just part of it. It is what it is, um, especially without the kind of door picking policy they have in berlin i think in the uk and other parts of europe you're just gonna have to put up with it because there's nothing else in place that's going to prevent them from coming because they have to pee they're interested to, to come they they seek it out they've queued up why not let them in like, why not let them in and enjoy it? at this rate why not let them fly over to your country spend money in your economy and prop up your you know your your scene in general and allow you to kind of live to fight another day but yeah interesting news there people heading off to ib for very very soon again probably covid passports are going to be necessary in order for you to go and dance and wave your hand in the air in front of a dc10 crowd um whilst martinez you know brothers play in the background but hey sometimes sacrifices have to be made for the things that you enjoy bu, 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 bu. next on the list what else do we have here this is a bit this is late news old news but hey i'm giving it to you anyway because you know what i'm a good guy this is courtesy of tmz kim kardashian files for a divorce from kanye you know old news so no point going over this too long but you know the deal um most people probably had this on the cars most people assumed it was going to happen sooner um they've you know probably outlasted a lot of people's expectations just in more so as a family you know they got four kids um they obviously had some love for each other you could see from the brief occasions that we saw them in front of the camera talking about each other there was general love and appreciation there but you know things change man and you know yeah Kanye has gone a bit cuckoo gaga but this could be an also just an extent or this could be a consequence of just covid you know covid's really um tested a lot of, or lockdown mostly has tested a lot of people's relationships uh whether they're personal or professional it's really made people question the people they live with the people they spend their time with the people they talk to on the phone blah 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 blah, blah. there's a lot of that things happening it's le it's led to people internal i think it's led to people kind of doing some internal audits of their friendship group of their contact list i'm sure people have sat down and deleted certain you know message threads that they're part of whatsapp groups that they were in like there's people 
you know really um you know taking a fine comb comb tooth comb fine tooth comb fine tooth comb to their life and making sure they get all the nuts out because the last thing you want especially during this prolonged period of time is to just come out of this being exactly the same person that you were when you got into it and you know maybe at the beginning of the year maybe at the beginning of this whole thing it could have been you know you could have maybe just pretended and rid the wave but you know spending what the best part of 11 months plus it might be up to 18 by the time we get out of here in the uk is bound to change some things and you know these two powerhouses living in the same roof living under the same roof you know interacting with each other a lot more than they probably would have you know maybe if the world was reopened you know kanye would be out on tour maybe who knows kim would be probably on you know on tour as well promoting all her shit but when you're suddenly at home and you're having to face up with your stuff and you're kind of um seeing all the things that you don't that you probably ignore or put to the back burner it can get difficult in it so let's read this this is the following game of fashion is filed for divorce from kanye after almost seven years of marriage but our sources say it's amicable as a divorce can be our sources being probably her mum um kim is asking for joint legal and physical custody of couples for children um sources with direct knowledge tell tmz that kanye is fine with a joint custody arrangement and we're told both kim and Ye are committed to co-parenting together there's a prenup but we're told that neither party is consenting it's contesting it sorry in fact our sources say that they are already far along the reaching a uh, property settlement agreement the docs filed by diso queen laura wasser uh, don't list don't list the date of separation it's listed as to be determined the day is almost irrelevant because their split has been so well chronicled in the news and social media so from what they're saying it's amicable they split on good terms things just haven't worked out but god damn it what a run especially that last year man that was an epic epic episode Kanye going you know in front of a whole group of people and basically telling them all that his wife nearly got an abortion and got rid of their first child um crying about the idea of his daughter growing up and being anything like a mother calling the mother-in-law Chris Jong-un like just epic 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 things things that you just think like if she wasn't as yeah you know what f give her credit because um, women le women less than you know of less position of less access and wealth and resources and status than Kim would have probably left already right but she purposely you know went out of her way to be like no 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 I'm staying by this guy and I think that's something to be commended man it really is because you know it's like if anything he was bad for her business she's going out there freeing prisoners um trying to you know um trying to win back some grace or some appreciation and love from the black community it feels like probably doing a little bit too hard but still it's coming from a good place isn't it and again the people that have been released from prison don't give a fuck is kim kardashian doing it they just want to get out of there so the fact that she's doing it anyway and using her resources and her time to do it which she could be doing you know she could be standing in front of a mirror taking a picture and you know getting a million likes and making a million bucks per post but she's doing that so it's definitely credit to her it's definitely something to be commended for and yeah she stayed man she tried to make it work it didn't work you know it is what it is things move on um it'll be interesting to see what happens going forward in terms of what kanye does creatively um as much as people let us you know say that he gave a lot to her i'm sure her coming in especially with the structure they have putting certain things into place he wasn't in debt before they got together right major that's when he said that first paris fashion week show that he put together they kind of fund that of his own pocket um really messed him up and you know the nike deal falling through loads of stuff and he wasn't really the most financially literate person in the world and you know kind of kim came through put him in contact with certain people i'd assume or maybe just the fact that he was married changed the conversation because you know hollywood and all those things it's just sometimes it's just perception just the fact that he was um looking like he was a married man and settling down and having a big family could have maybe opened doors that he probably didn't have access to because i remember there was a time when he kept complaining that he wasn't being given the same access that brands like stella mccartney get given right he was like oh there's a certain level of finish that those brands can get because they have access to the certain manufacturers and producers da, 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 da. and then suddenly you know he has access to that and we see what he's basically done with easy right multi-billion dollar um corporation brand they've been able to kind of start up from the bottom and get to where it is now at the at, the, at this current position and still be something that sort of you know lauded and heralded and kind of desired by a lot of people even though it's kind of you know mass um uh widely available that's what i'd say yeah so you know a lot a lot there to kind of view and see from the outside i guess we're gonna have to just see how this all develops as it goes forward but you know if they're amicable you know they have access and funds it's again it's not like 
some single mum from East London getting divorced, isn't it? <laughs> this is this is completely different. You know, Kim being a single mum is not the same <laughs> as your neighbour. You know what I mean? That's for sure. That's for sure. Let's move on from that one. Do, 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 do. What else we have here? Oh, yes, we have Epic, <laughs> Ted Cruz, the legend. So as I said <laughs> before about, you know, maybe COVID did probably as much as it's been you know a tragic you know occasion a tragic thing to go through people have lost family members businesses it's just been terrible right loads of negatives probably far more than that way the positive but one slight positive i'd say a glimmer of positivity would be the exposed um politicians and media elites and mainstream media and whatever they may be and you know the financial institutions and stuff that's going on with gamestop and robin hood they've all been exposed right they've all been laid to bear their hypocrisies their indignation their lack of empathy, their unwillingness to help and reach back, it's all been laid bare. And there's no bigger example of this than Ted Cruz during a flipping winter disaster in Texas, right? Where electricity and heat and just freedom of movement is completely locked off because, you know, they've suffered a completely crazy out of this world snowstorm. He decides to up sticks and take his family to Cancun because they were cold. And then when he gets cool, because again, the Cancun thing isn't a big deal. Again, it's ter terrible. He's a governor in Texas, right? He should be, um, sorry, the senator, sorry, um, in Texas. He should be there doing something. It doesn't mean you know he can turn the power back on and fix a generator or fix a grid, but at least be there in just a performative sense, you know, doing the thing that you would expect someone to be doing like him, you know, wellness checks, being on the phone, pictures of him, over a bit of paper or over a laptop i don't know whatever it is performative that's what politicians do no one thinks when a politician's you know on the phone that they're actually talking to anybody on the phone it's all just politics all just kind of photo ops or whatever he doesn't do that right and he just goes cool no problem you know um politicians are hypocritical politicians you know it's not necessarily a civic duty is it it's just more sort of things that you just do because it's a job um that's okay do what you need to do the thing that's actually re um reprehensible and something that is just just terrible indictment of him as a person as a character and as a man is his excuse for it right because again you can go cancun is a great place i'd imagine i've not been myself um i've been to mexico but i've not been to actual cancun you know raving it up and you know you know racking up lines on the bar as uh, you know some great you know reggaeton plays over the stereo i'm sure it's a great place to go but when you do get caught and you have to answer for yourself and this is what you say this is when you're an absolute piece of shit hear this from the video on the cell phone was was whether the decision uh to go was tone deaf look it, it was obviously a mistake and in hindsight I, I wouldn't have done it um i was trying to be a dad and and all of us have made decisions when you've got two girls who have been cold for two two days and haven't had heater power what? and they're saying, hey, look, we don't have school. Why don't we go? Let's get out of here. I, I think there are a lot of parents that'd be like, all right, let me if I can do this. Great. That's what I wanted to do. He blamed his daughters. From what I remember, what I saw in here online, I think they're teenagers, so it's probably not going to be as damaging as it would do if they were like young children, you know, under the age of 15 or something. It'd be devastating to have your dad like lie on you, but I'm, I'm, I'm sure they're aware of what he does as a job and it is what it is. Sometimes, you know, he's going to have to use their names as, you know, a sympathy, uh, as a tool of sympathy or as an excuse to get out of certain things. But imagine taking your family to, to Cancun because you want to accept the cold and then blaming it on your daughters. The fact that he thinks that he's, you know, we, anyone will believe that his daughters have the, you know, the authority in his home to just tell his, tell them, hey, I, on like a dime on the same day, let's go, is a joke. And then, of course, later on, um, which I wasn't necessarily a big fan of, the, the, the text messages between Ted Cruz's wife and a few other wives in their area got leaked. And it was obviously, you know, the, what it basically exposed was that they obviously planned it because, you know, one part of the story was true. They did want to go because it was cold. Evidently so. It makes complete sense because you know you, you texas is not meant to known to be at alaska so i'm sure you know if you have the means to do it a lot of people with wealthy means are probably flying out themselves 
But that text message thread just exposed that it wasn't the daughters. It was actually the parents that organized it, uh, specifically Ted Cruz's wife. She's the one that kind of was the quote unquote um, group message admin that put that whole event together. <clears throat> and again, I'm not a fan of the text messages. I think that's unbecoming. I think that, you know, Ted Cruz has did already enough of the damage. You need to get the wife involved. But just imagine it in front of the camera. First of all, imagine you get caught for something like this. And instead of the first thing you want to do is to actually go to the places where people are suffering the most and do something again, performative, because it's not coming from a genuine place because he's only back in Texas because he got shamed into coming back, right? It kind of got exposed on social media, specifically on Twitter. Someone saw him or recognized him through his mask and then uploaded it and then, you know, it just went crazy on the on, on the feed because this is at the time. I think Texas is much better now, but this was at a time when it was really bad and it was a story of a eleven year old kid dying through cold, like just terrible, tragic stories, right? And he was obviously in the airport, so people were just boiling and foaming at the mouth to, you know, hang hang this hang this guy up, right? Um, French Revolution style guillotine, right? Just uh, furious. So he obviously didn't come out because he cared. So if, if you're going to come back because, you know, you get shamed into it, the least you could do is be performative and go to the places where people are hurting, hand out some waters, you know, roll up your sleeves, take off your tie, whatever. Nah, the first thing he wants to do when he gets off the plane is get in front of the media and explain himself, uh, justify his decision. That's that's kind of quasi sociopathy, right? That is, that is an element of it. Like the first thing you want to do is kind of rewrite the narrative. Um, people say he's a bit on the spectrum anyway Ted Cruz I'm not too sure if that's true I just think you know in 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 you know in regular everyday life he gets away with this every single day but you know we're living in lockdown um, a freak um, you know natural event has happened in Texas and he probably just you know was oblivious to the pain of everybody else because he's an elite right like they they kind of give you this idea that they're here to serve you and serve your best interests when in reality they're only there to kind of line their pockets and make sure that their family's okay but yeah blaming your children man is just wild <laughs> like but what do you expect in it what do we expect let's move on here what else do we have to talk and be we got that we got this <clears throat> What else do we have here? Oh, yeah, this is, yeah, this is good, isn't it? So, obviously, in response to that, you know, again, political gesturing, whatever it may be, but still, the optics look so bad for Ted Cruz, isn't it? So, off the back of it, he's, you know, out there in Cancun trying to get his family all nice and warm on those sandy beaches, you know, crystal blue seas. Republic, uh, um, Representative Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, AOC, raises $5 million for Texas winter storm relief. And she's not even from there. She's from New York, right? And she's raising over $5 million for people that have been affected by the storm in Texas. Do you know how bad this looks on Ted? Like, oh, God. So is here, U.S. Representative, um, Republican AOC, uh, the New York has now helped raise more than five million dollars for the winter storm relief in Texas. The news comes just days after the New York Congresswoman traveled to Houston to volunteer at the Houston <laughs> feedback on Saturday. Uh, joining Houston Congresswoman uh, Shelia Jackson, Shelia Sh Sh Shelia Jackson Lee, and Sylvia Gracia, um, AOC um, said the winter storm, which became an escalating crisis when power outages and pipe pressures issues left many Texans without food and water, was an opportunity for people across the country to come together and help but obviously again an opportunity for her to political grandstand but in this case the same goes for kim kardashian letting out prisoners who gives a shit if you've been out without water and without electricity and you've been sitting in your car to warm up and huddling up with your family and all this malarkey your house is flooded and you know mold and um your, your home that probably isn't built for the winter is completely devastated you don't care who delivers that five million dollars relief you don't care who but the fact that she's taken advantage of this in such an epic way you know she tr she not only just raised it from afar and go find me she actually went there uh, boots on the ground right in front of these people connecting with them showing them who she's looking them in the eye and this is a red state imagine this could do some the amount of damage that that one action ted cruz can do to the entire republican party is just hilarious man these people are so dumb 
<laughs> it continues um, bus more needed da, da, da. she said here the disasters don't strike everyone equally AOC said on the steps of a food bank on Saturday when you already have so many families in the state and across the country that are on the brink and that can't even afford the emergency to begin with and you have a disaster like this it can set people back for years not just for days definitely agree with that one the new congresswoman started a fund ra raising money on Thursday afternoon after the media text was lost power in less than a day AOC said people had contributed more than one million dollars uh, a little more than 12 hours later she announced two million dollars have been raised as of sunday night the new york congresswoman helped raise more than five million dollars all money raised goes directly to the organizations and there's a couple of videos of her speaking quite eloquently about the whole thing from her twitter feed let me see if i can load this up for you there we go she definitely took great advantage of this and then put her foot forward right? again you can't blame the woman man she's People can say a lot of things. Again, I'm I'm not a fan of the histrionics. I think um, emotionally blackmailing people to vote for you in any way, shape, or form. Some of the, you know, she can be a little bit over dramatic and whatever it may be. But in general, for what she's doing, like she's no dummy, right? She might have, you know, she might be politically inexperienced, but she's not a dumb woman. She knows exactly what she's doing, and she's played this like a blinder. Again, Ted Cruz is, you know, the greatest on goal of all time. You know, being a governor. Um, uh, Senator, sorry, of Texas and leaving during one of his worst times to go and, you know, sunny yourself with your family. It's just, you know, irre irre irrevocable. You can't, you can't justify or legislate for that whatsoever. But AOC came up there and just kind of popped the goal in the net. Open goal, we still got to pop in the net. But here's what she has to say. We're in Texas, so we got to go big with that support. This is not just an issue for Texans. This is an issue for our entire country. We need to make sure that we make short and long-term policy decisions so that this kind of devastation, preventable devastation, never happens again. Disasters don't strike everyone equally. When you already have so many families in the state and across the country that are on the brink, when you have a disaster like this, it can just set people back for years not just for days you know we really need to make sure that we're getting look at her man oh teddy boy the Houston food bank no questions are asked if you are documented undocumented no matter what your income no matter your housing status you can get help here wow. this is one of the reasons why we are so proud to support the Houston food bank because we want to help everybody you need it we'll be there that's the new york spirit that's the texan spirit that's the american spirit amazing isn't it? And, uh, and again the turnaround that she could be able to put that together is just pretty pretty good <laughs> it has to be said and it's a really great advertisement for the green new deal isn't it to be honest right especially for people that were very skeptical about the whole thing and this is the second one let's see if we can get that loaded this is taking a bit of time let's get this one up but yeah man what an own goal by teddy boy isn't it absolutely dumb dumb move by him but again you know these people man they have sometimes they have literally legitimate worm for brains you really do wonder <laughs> with these people when it comes to these sort of things you're like ay, ay, ay. uh you could have just left on a pj and you probably wouldn't have got caught right but i, I don't know why didn't you do that you reckon probably because you have any money i don't know but uh, going <laughs> on a regular plane to go <laughs> oh, amazing but this is what's this one um from the the, the what she just says here come on play what is this one saying? Come on, you gonna play or not? <clears throat> After in one way or another, and very sadly and unfortunately, climate change is making these kinds of disasters worse, more frequent, and with a green new deal, baby, climate change, get in there. She's taking a great advantage of this. A lot more intensity, and so you know, just a few years ago, we had these devastating floods in the Midwest. We've been hit in New York with Hurricane Sandy. You know, we had Harvey here in Houston, and now fires, we have fires, fires California. in California, freezes. It is sad, but this is part of our new normal as a country. And we're going to have to really get really good at responding to these disasters swiftly and effectively, and also making the infrastructure investments necessary to prevent these kind of catastrophic uh, chain impacts from happening again and frank top girl man you can't you can't be mad at the woman you can't be mad at her you cannot be mad at her what else do we have here what else do we have here what else do we have here let's move on yes move on to this one actually 
do this. So, guess who's back? Guess who's back? I've, I've been wondering this for a while, right? I think I made a couple of videos wondering how out loud, wondering out loud, aloud, however way you say it, when Chris D'Elia would make a comeback. Of course, as you guys know, you know, last year, some very serious allegations came out concerning Chris D'Elia, the comedian. Um, now that some time has gone by, the allegations were a little bit, you know, didn't really have that much weight to them it just seemed like he was a bit much of a he was a he was a bit of a horny dog in the dms uh probably took it a bit too far with a couple of um scenarios which I, from what i can remember involved girls at the time who might have been under asia he didn't know then when they told him the age he then stepped away and then when they turned of age he didn't went back in the dms that was one of the things that was a bit off then there was that story with a lady i think she might be the comedian where he supposedly touched her he probably exposed herself in a car or something those are the ones right but again like you know the coming back when somebody's of age is it illegal no is it creepy yes you know you're gonna leave your sister or your you know <laughs> or anyone that you know that's female around him probably not um the story involving a comedian where he exposed himself is again it's alleged we don't really have any knowledge of it we weren't there no charge were brought against him it is what it is uh, but for the most part again i think i mentioned in one of my original videos the actual thing that really did sink him overall that really did affect him the most was this um what do you call it we got like a we got like um his persona got shattered in it right because he's this happy-go-lucky goofy silly goose guy and then suddenly you're seeing these dms and he's like this you know he's this cold sniper in the dms who's kind of lining up you know chick after chick after chick after chick during his shows and when he's on tour and it just completely threw you through you for a loop because you didn't see him that way of course you know everyone knows chris Lee has a very um, large female fan base he's probably one of the only um i'd say what uh conventionally attractive men in stand-up comedy a lot of these comedians look like burt kreischer and stuff right they're not exactly the most um pleasing phys physical specimens i guess for the female population so he had that weird position that he occupied where he was kind of young enough to have been on vine but then old enough to have still be a bit of a the zaddy as they call him for the girls right he had that kind of allure about him um so he was probably just the only one probably going through this weird experience where he legitimately had loads of really attractive young women sliding into his dm when he was going on shows and of course that gets a bit too crazy and you can get a bit of your head of yourself and then add that to what he explained in the video that i'm going to play a bit where he basically confesses and says he um has a sexual addiction and that's what led him to the position where he was kind of you know essentially like i said going on tour and lining up chick after chick after chick and then having that essentially uh be the downfall of his career he did take a year off to kind of reflect it seems like you know going to therapy address his demons blah -de blah 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 and from what i can see he did seem quite sincere i thought the apology was pretty well done um i thought he got away he got his got away with it he got he got his points of freud just there he got his points across pretty well um he seemed remorseful um he seemed reflective um completely different demean demeanor of course you know he's not going to be going um it's cancelled on here do you know what I mean he's not going to be saying that sort of stuff but i thought it was a pretty decent approach and a pretty decent way to go about it and again probably the best of the bunch from his community especially when you consider how brian callum dealt with the situation probably the worst ever you could deal with it right um you know trying to record a podcast straight after the allegations come out having it taken down then doing one behind a the paywall then um saying you will not be silenced then doing a good then doing one with a guy that clearly got some sort of substance abuse issues you know then getting ran off that because people don't want that on their platform then you know uh suing the husband of one of your accusers because he's defaming you and not allowing you to do shows imagine this guy like honestly callan probably dealt with it the worst isn't it? like again it's hard to say it's hard to say because you don't know if these allegations are all false you know like what are you meant to do if you generally believe you didn't do nothing wrong you're not meant to just sit there and just you know let your career that you've worked 20 plus years more since the day you've been born to kind of cultivate just disappear from you but uh, unfortunately in this current you know climate that we're living in at the moment unless you've got the receipts like justin bieber you just have to lay low for a period of time and if you and if you do come out you have to come out with a plan you know boom 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 you can't just be you know i want to go and talk on my podcast and then no you can't go shut up you know do it behind a paywall you go do it behind a paywall 
and then <laughs> and then you don't have the ability to you don't have the visibility anymore then you can't sell tickets you have to go back on your show it's just like oh yeah yeah but anyway Chris Lee have made an apology let's play a little bit of it now I'm sure most of you have probably seen it anyway but let's play the clip um, a little bit of it as we start this hi everyone um I know that it's been a really long time since you've heard from me. Um, and when the news broke, um, I put out a statement that said everything I've done has been legal and consensual, and that's true. And I wanted that statement to speak for itself. Um, and I wanted to talk immediately. I wanted to post online. I wanted to do my podcast business as usual. But I, I thought that that might not be the best thing what might be the best thing if i it would be if i just take this time to be with my family try and uh take a long hard look at myself and good decision, good decision. and just uh and and do that and um it was it was a lot it was hard i i first of all um i i do know how it looks uh <laughs> with the uh with all the tell me how it looks mate it looks really bad <laughs> understatement of the year in it understatement of the year i know how it looks you know while you're standing there like you know um covered in blood and uh you know a woman behind you lifeless <laughs> i know how it just looks <laughs> stuff that's been said and the the emails that have been put out there and what the media has been uh trying to say and i know it looks bad um and it <laughs> it doesn't show the full scope of the of what happened um i stand by the fact that all my relationships have been consensual and legal and that's just it um that's the truth i through this kind of time away um i've seeked out a lot of kind of um you know medical advice therapy and stuff like that uh that doesn't matter here nor there but what i have come to understand is um this was always about sex to me my life was i mean sex controlled my life it 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 was the focus it was my focus um which is understandable if you consider the other addictions people probably suffer from and the struggles that other comedians have gone through during lockdown um you look at you know the alcoholism the just being away from your family the you know the validation from strangers it's it makes sense you know what i mean because of course chris is like what sober doesn't treat doesn't do any drugs you have to have some sort of vice and this is one of his vices right getting up on stage putting together new material sick material getting comedy special getting specials on netflix starring in hit shows on you know on netflix as well doing t tv series you know on regular tv or whatever it is and then also using the opportunity to go and tour the country and you know expose himself and be in front of expose himself yeah another fraudulent slip but you know be in the presence of you know gorgeous women from all over the country and just kind of enjoy the fruits of that and it can get a bit too nuts it can definitely get too nuts and again i just think part of the story as well that was bad on him was more so the i guess the douchebaggery of it i think a, a couple of girls in the story is alleged that he was just you know always on his phone his friends group of friends were weird um it was quite transactional he just didn't seem like the most funnest guy to be around and i think a couple of ladies have basically said especially the ones that are actually fans of him they were kind of looking forward to going to hang out of course um some of them were naive as hell just thinking oh you know just going if you're gonna go hang out with a uh, a man in his flipping late 30s at 2 a.m in the morning in his hotel room that you're gonna be you know playing flipping candy crush right some of them were naive but most of them were very aware that they were probably gonna have some sort of intimate you know um experience with the guy but they just wanted to have a silly goose time too right they've known him from the podcast they've seen all these clips online they've watched his specials they've seen him on these shows they wanted to see that guy for a bit before you know he maybe stunk, stuck his tongue down their throat allegedly when that didn't happen it kind of just threw him into a loop like wow you're just a real douchebag and you're like any all the other guys you know that kind of general turn and that's why i thought kind of fucked him up 
in the same way that Callum's story about you know him saying to one of the women oh you're gonna be my girlfriend now right that phrase that he sort of used in the few podcasts and the story about him exposing himself to some lady in a shop or something they all sounded quite legit that's what fucked him up it's not that I think looking back at these issues it's not that you get accused of these things because I think you can any man can get accused of whatever especially if somebody is vindictive and they just want to burn you right they just put an accusation out there and it could effectively derail your entire career um but if you've got a semblance of douchebaggery in you, there's probably an occasion, an encounter you've had with a woman that you've probably been a dick unnecessarily. And those people are vindictive and they want to kind of get their own back on you. And when they put the story out, even if they just put out the facts and maybe be a bit vague with the facts, sorry, and leave out some important details, it can look really, really bad, especially if it kind of marries up to your actual personality. And I guess with this, because it was just such an opposite, I think, you know, that that's where, that's what probably saved Louis C.K., right? The fact that he was a complete, you know, uh, piece of shit for the most part, lack of a better term on stage, right? He told you all his deepest, darkest thoughts. So when that story did come out about Louis C.K., you didn't really bat an eyelid because, you know, it's Louis C.K. But when you hear somebody like, you know, I don't want to mention somebody else that's clean cut because I don't want to put an X on their name. But if you heard of somebody that's like a you know a clean comic that's very wholesome, you know, imagine if you heard a story about Tom Papa. You know what I mean? That would really set you aback. You'd be like, huh? You wouldn't know what to do. So I think that's what really messed Chris Lee up in this extent. But again, you know, he's owned up to it. He took time away. He dealt with it. I think in the best possible way you could deal with it. I don't think at the time he could have come out and really done anything that would have changed the narrative. Because again, you have to remember at that time when that story came out, it seemed like there was a concerted effort behind the scenes you know in front of the scenes uh, within the mainstream media to take down the entire comedy industry it looked like they were really fishing for stories and you know these guys perform late at night in cd basement bars and venues in very um you know uh, less than ideal situations uh, you know they're on the road for you know days on end you know playing for you know 50 bucks or petrol money whatever it may be so i'm sure they've had some very sketchy encounters and you know it brings out the worst in people i'd imagine I, you know, i'm a fan of light life i go out to dance and rave sometimes and dj i know what it's like out there i can just imagine what it's like for a comedian um it's probably it's probably rough so um when those stories were being fished he probably he was the unfortunately the sacrificial lamb for everybody he took the bear he bear he bore the brunt of it really if you think about it even though Callan's accusations think about it are far more um you know serious than what um Delia's allegations were he kind of got less of the blow I think when you're the first one out the gate especially within a little community you tend to get most of the bombs on you and then the other people that get accused you know um after the fact don't get as many and you can kind of you know ride their wave but you know what what, what can you do um he served his time, I think, as I said before, I'm not really a fan of cancel culture in terms of corporations and broadsheets and shit deciding to cancel you and, you know, media companies and all that stuff because, you know, you know, you don't use the right pronouns, whatever nonsense it is. I still think it's up to the consumers. If the consumers have enough of you and they don't care about what you have to say and they've kind of got enough of you, that's when you get cancelled, right? If your fans don't care anymore, I don't think it's up to the media to tell you who you should and shouldn't be a fan of and, you know, Obviously, most more likely than not, Chris's career in Hollywood is probably over. You know, there's there. It seems that like there is no redemption or um, forgiveness or you know way to come back into your career unless you're one of the outliers. I don't know. I can imagine if Ryan Seacrest got accused of something, he'd be fine. There's some people that just you know have a position for life, but for most people, if you do get an accusation, even just like this is not even true, it basically you know means your career is completely done. So that's one thing that's bad. But I guess and again, like I said, he's in a really you know fortunate position where he's a stand up comedian um uh, he's got a pretty successful podcast he's got a great group of friends in that podcast world who they could invite on to his show too he'll be fine he'll get up he'll, he'll be back on his feet in no time especially when the world reopens up again people you know his fans would want to go to see him perform stand up his friends will want to put him on his show to allow him to kind of get his voice out there and he'll keep continuing trucking on but you know the dream of him being an action movie star it's probably gone unless he does indie movies and shit for the foreseeable future but you know um beggars can't be choosers especially if you've been accused of what he's been accused of but hey he's innocent also it seems we don't know we don't know who knows who knows let me know what you think in the comments below do you think it was a good apology um do you think it's too soon should you have come back earlier i'd like to know your thoughts and opinions down below okay what else do we have to talk about here? Let's move this up again. Let's see. I'm going to 
let's, yeah, let's take this hat off because you can't see me, can you? You can't see me. You can't see me in this little trendy cap. Um, what else do we have here? What else do we have here? Bish bash bosh. Oh yeah, this is the one. This is here. Yeah. Uh, this is KSC of the Fire and the Kid episode number 657. Of course, they spoke a little bit about the Crystal Ear situation. And it seems as if, just, just from what I'm thinking, that Brendan's a bit of a liar, right? Let's just play this clip, but I think he's a bit of a liar. I think he's talking out of his bum hole here. But let's see. Let's play the clip and you can judge it for yourself. But I think, from what I remember, this is all lies. But let's see what you guys think. To the group chat. Right? Yeah, I sent yeah. to you guys. I thought... Um... I thought I thought it was best case scenario. I thought he nailed it as far as like an apology yeah. thing and just giving everybody an update and just letting people know like you know he's been getting help, which he has. I talk to Chris every week. Mm -hmm. He's been getting help and uh, just taking the necessary steps to to come back, man. And I I think it's weird too. It's like you know obviously a year away from work from making a dime off his talents. It's like how how much do you want to punish punish the guy? Mm -hmm. and and what and what uh what what charges were pressed yeah i'm I'm waiting what charges were pressed i'm brian or or chris yeah what charges do you have yeah you bring me charges it's different conversation different conversation but that's a weird justification again i understand you know again he's a friend i'm a fan of the guy too it's a weird justification because there's no charges it means you're innocent it's from what I've understand of doing my little research is on the Google. It's pretty difficult to convict anybody of, you know, sexual assault. It's a pretty much a he says, he said sort of thing. Um, you know, I'm assuming there's a statute of limitations. I'm assuming there's only so much you can do, um, you know, with certain st in certain states in terms of even filing a report, what that report actually does in the long term. And also in some occasions too, I would imagine if you're the victim, it's less so about the person being, you know, thrown into solitary confinement and more so about you being able to tell your story, get it off your chest, clear your conscience, put it out there and kind of, you know, make sure everyone's aware of this person and what they did to you in the past. That's probably what it's more so about um, than actually making sure that you kind of, you know, stick this person up. Because we've seen what happens when women are actually empowered to make sure that somebody actually pays the full price of the law of what they've done, right? Harvey Weinstein is a good example. Uh you know um what's the guy's name uh the other dude uh bernie well, it doesn't matter you know the gun to the black comedian i forgot his name he's played it's, it's case my head um cosby right the same thing happened with him too you could see what happens in those occasions but they're pretty rare for all the other situations that you've heard of of people being accused of assault whatever it is what has actually happened to them in the court of law not a lot, right? They've had reputational damage, which is probably worse than anything that would happen in the court of law. Obviously, it's not any sort of... Um, it doesn't give any the victims any kind of closure because you're still seeing the person plastered on billboards. But usually, reputational damage does lead to your agency dropping you, you getting taken off a show. You know, you've seen what's happened with Army Hammer, right? He essentially has a bit of a kink and maybe he went a bit over top with some of the, his past relationships he was in. But for the most part, did he do anything illegal, Army Hammer? Not really. And what's happened to him? Reputational damage, right? He's been dropped by his agency. He's got taken off of a movie I think he was filming. And essentially, his career is completely gone, right? Unless he moves to Europe and does something he's done in the United States and that's probably far worse than him going to prison because he's unlikely to set and to spend any time in jail um you know for crimes that are pretty hard to prove either way especially stuff that can you know involves you know relationships you know it's just just hard to kind of justify so to say that you know just because he didn't get charged in the court of law it means he's innocent is a horrible defense but again you know what do we expect from Einstein here were you talking about rumors and what are we gonna yeah. what are what are we supposed to do? Callan Callan can't what are we come supposed on, to do? Callan can't come on his own show for, for how long? We give him a, basically a year off. A year of discipline. I talk to Callan every single day. Mm -hmm. That's what else is interesting. It's kinda like he didn't give me you know, off. with with that um CISO hotel thing where all these YouTubers thought, Oh, this, this and this and the text was like, You guys don't have the facts, you don't know what you're talking about. You don't about. know what you're talking it's about. It's fun to talk about. Yeah. It. Same thing with me and Brian. Oh, Brendan threw Brian under the bus. Brendan kicked Brian off the show. Whoa, you guys have no clue what you're talking no about. No fucking clue. I talked to Brian every single day. We had a plan. You're seeing it come to fruition. Brian was getting compensated every single day for not being here because what happened to him was out of my control, out of his control. Mm -hmm. So we we 
there's no book on how to do this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But you can see we had a plan. Chris has a plan. We're all, we all have conversations that you guys don't get to see because you're not our friends. And it's not for Ooh. the public. <laughs> Just straight up. That's hey, straight up know, right yeah, there. That's up. not our friends. But again, let's rewrite some facts here. That's not true. We remember what happened. What actually happened, he got accused of what he got accused of. No, let's actually rewind it back a little bit. When Chris Alia got accused of what he got accused of, instead of these guys calling up their friend and discussing it over the phone, you know, p being there to support him and maybe just not talking about him in public because, hey, he's your friend. Why would you want to bury him and talk about something that's just happened raw in the moment in front of camera, in front of, you know, half a million people and maybe more on your podcast? It makes absolutely no sense. They didn't do that. Instead, they went in front of the camera, tried to get a, a really real reaction from it, which kind of led to the iconic, you know, scenes of Brendan crying, the I can't talk thing, slapping away the camera, sobbing, Brian Callan using the time in between his tears to let you know that he wasn't really good friends with Chris and all that mad stuff then when the accusations came out about Callan it seemed like it was a bit of a karmic restitution right that these guys that were trying their best to distance themselves from Callan from Crystalia sorry crying as if they've never seen him be a womanizer in any way shape or form this is out this world oh my god it's so sad so sad crying and then suddenly now they're put in a position where one of his co-hosts you know, his co-hosts and Brian Callan is accused of something far worse right allegedly he's accused of rape uh, you know Chris Lear maybe is accused of being horny and maybe sliding into some dms of girls he probably has no business being in but rape and you know allegedly being a bit of a nonce i know what i would rather have on my docket again don't give me either because i'm a christian but still that's what happened then when that happened could uh, Callum put out a statement i think an instagram thing saying he's going to go on a podcast and address everything everyone was looking forward to the podcast on saturday it was a special thing it didn't happen it did transpire then suddenly the other show doesn't come out um and then and then i think from there they try to do a show then that show gets taken down and then basically what ends up happening is that we find out that they're signed to this company called cast media which is some sort of production or ad buying company wherever it is it's, you know it's got a whole load of podcasts on there everything from impulsive i think used to be on there the portal with eric weinstein is on there loads of stuff right loads of podcasts that are mainly i guess la based are uh, on this thing called cast media and i guess they're the ones that are in charge of the ads because they basically didn't allow brian to come back on the show because it was bad for business because no advertisers want to advertise on the show with brian callan sitting in that hot seat so he went because of that not because of them having a plan or putting things into place it was because of that and obviously because the podcast brings in i'd imagine most of their revenue maybe outside of brendan because he's got a lot of other things that he does but it's a big money earner for both of these guys the sensible thing to do would be to extract yourself from the position and allow it to function and then obviously you still collect a check behind the scenes because you know again why would you cut if you know to spite your face it makes complete sense right they did it and it kind of worked out um obviously for them it's monetarily the show continued the views are you know drastically down compared to what they do usually you can even see in this video where they're talking about it, it's like 130,000 usually uh 130,000 yeah, 130,000 usually it's about half a million quarter of a million with um sometimes the dead ones with Callum but you know the views did completely dip then Callan goes off to do his own podcast, Conspiracy Social Club, with Sam Tripoli, you know, somebody who, you know, some people may be accused of having some sort of substance abuse issues. It doesn't necessarily go as planned. It's not as actually that good. Vimeo is taking it down, da 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 And now we're in a position later on down the line with as times as a lapse and time has gone by where, in my opinion, why things happen, more than likely, because Callan was on the show recently, was that Callan's probably finding it difficult to sell tickets. In, obviously in COVID market it's difficult because even though you know venues are half the capacity people are not people are a little bit gun shy about buying tickets to go places and they probably have a lot of concern about being in places with you know densely packed audiences laughing at comedy they're just a bit worried about going there but in general you know he's struggling to sell tickets so the best place to go and promote yourself is to the fan base that you've cultivated over the last what 10 plus years so they decided to go back in there you know it's it's just what it is but to suggest that it's some sort of grand plan that he had put in place of how we're going to make sure you bounce back and stuff no you didn't right Callum probably approached it the worst way possible he was ranting and raving online all the time um suing the flipping husband of one of the victims because he was essentially um, ruining his chance of going on tour and doing performing in front of stage he then went on all the you know standard you know um right wing i guess platforms to go and try and redeem himself loads of just you know core 
corny stuff that you wouldn't really think would be a great place a great way to kind of get your career back up and going but maybe he's kind of come to the quiet resolution or realization that that stuff is completely over but to suggest that it's some sort of big grand plan and you know our friends is like mm, let's wind your neck in a bit and do a bit mate you know what i mean it's not that big of a deal but hey what can you do in it these guys are odd odd human beings but yeah, what do you guys think? Do you think um, there was a grand plan? Do you think they didn't knew exactly what they were going to do? Or do you think this was just, you know, a uh, happenstance that kind of fell within their lap? Because again, you know, we're, we're still living in COVID, in COVID times. You know, parts of America are still locked down. People have other things that they're worrying about. Um, other scandals have transpired since that time. You know, it's been a year. People are going to, you know, get this stand-up comedy. How how much can you really get cancelled, you know? Unless you're, you know, Chris Lee and Canada kind of were maybe bad examples because they both had like network TV sort of deal things going on behind the scenes, whatever it may be. But you can ride it out if you're smart enough, you know what I mean? It's not that difficult to do. If Lucy K can make a comeback, you, those guys can make a comeback, do you know what I mean? It's not that difficult. Um, but yeah, let me know what you think thinking below in the thoughts down below. Let me know what you think. What else we got here? What else we got here? Duh, 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 duh. Duh, 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 duh. Yep, I think that might be it, you know. I think that might be it. So, that has been the Exxon Zing Show, number 436. Thanks so much for tuning in. As per usual, it's been a pleasure to have your company. Um, if it's your first time tuning to a show, make sure you smash that like button, hit subscribe, and leave me a comment down below. And of course, I'll see you guys again next time. Take care. Peace.